it is 9 30 and thank you for joining us at farming today uh, our sponsors this hour we want to recognize centricare and central minnesota credit union so let's hear from them <laughs> Farming is a family business, but it can also be complex. You need to keep everything balanced while adapting to change and unpredictable weather. At Central Minnesota Credit Union, we stick with our ag members through the good times and the bad. We recognize that farming is cyclical with its ups and downs, but through it all, we'll be right beside you. Many of our ag banking officers grew up on the farm themselves, so we understand the ins and outs of farm finances like no one else. It's part of our DNA. Central Minnesota Credit Union, open for agribusinesses. Insured by NCUA, equal opportunity lender. As a member-owned organization, our mission is enhancing the lives of members and community through strength, service, and growth. CMCU has always been willing to go the extra mile and work with members' requests. We are committed to serving our communities by sponsoring events, volunteering, and contributing to local organizations. These commitments are the foundation of your credit union, the reason for our success, and why we remain financially strong. Um, please welcome Chris Clayton, the Ag Policy Editor for DTN, the Progressive Farmer, here to tell us about moving ahead on Ag Policy. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, and uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, having me uh, on today. I appreciate it. Um, just briefly, if you're not familiar with DTN, the Progressive Farmer, um, our headquarters is actually based in uh, Burnsville, Minnesota. But uh, our big mothership, so to speak, is in Omaha, Nebraska. I live uh, in Glenwood, Iowa, just, uh, just outside of Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, we also have uh, the Progressive Farmer Magazine, which is based in Birmingham, Alabama. So those are our three really uh, big main offices. I've been with DTN since 2005, and I primarily uh, focus on issues uh, regarding uh, federal policy. Let's see if I can move my slides. There we go. Okay, just briefly want to mention, um, it probably sure smarter people have told you this, everybody, over the past couple of days, but a couple of quick deadlines. Uh, the crop insurance deadline uh, is March 15th for uh, Minnesota, most of I Iowa as well, and uh, several other uh, surrounding states. The uh, crop insurance guarantees for corn and soybeans. Uh, for corn, this is the highest since 2014. For soybeans, it's the highest since 2013. So uh, really good opportunities there. And uh, because of that, USDA sees that we'll plant uh, about over 90 million acres of both corn and soybeans this year. Uh, if you are a study of USDA's uh, monthly WASDE reports, uh, they made very few tweaks yesterday. They did note though that they expect to see about a, a billion, uh, excuse me, a million more bushels of soybeans go for seed this year. So they made a you know, slight adjustment there. Another thing to keep in mind, and also another March 15th deadline is the annual uh, ARC PLC sign up now. Um, probably 85% of farmers right now have signed up for that, but USDA has noted there's still about 250,000 farmers. They're trying to notify and, uh, and, and at least get you know, signed up for a, uh, for a meeting with their FSA advisor. So. Uh, I suspect everybody here has already taken care of that, but if you haven't, uh, you know, uh, get in touch with FSA and your local FSA office. 
So a um, couple of things I'm going to just go over here. You know, we're still in a pandemic, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the aid programs that are out there that USDA is uh, dealing with. First of all, we're at about 45 days into the Biden administration. Uh, early on, when uh, the president came in, uh, before Secretary Vilsack was even confirmed, they put a hold on most USDA rules and programs that had been initiated very late in the Trump administration. That included uh, CFAP additional aid, as that program was dubbed. That uh, was released uh, or put out just about a week before um, Sonny Perdue left office. Uh, it primarily dealt with uh, providing aid for contract livestock, producer, uh, livestock producers, except for you know uh, custom cattle feeders. And there's been a request to try to add custom cattle feeders to that, uh, to that aid. It also made some other adjustments in terms of prices. And then another program that's still out there is uh, WIP Plus and uh, changes that might be made for 2019 damages. Uh, WIP Plus uh, you know, was created in the, early in the Trump administration uh, by Congress. Um, disasters that happened in 2020 are not authorized for it yet. Every year we go through this kind of uh, crazy situation of trying to get WIP Plus added on for the last year's disasters, and they're still working on that. But the uh, USDA said when they release these programs, they will be extending the sign up. Uh, so that's something to pay, for, uh, to pay attention to. That December aid package that passed Congress still had a lot of provisions, though, that have yet to still be announced. You know, one of the big ones that jumps out was a $20 per acre payment for non-specialty crop producers based on their 2020 uh, Planted acres, so that's a that's a big deal for uh, for crop producers that uh, there might still be a twenty dollar an acre payment sitting out there for them. Uh, there was a special funding that was set aside for the dairy programs that we have in the farm bill. There was also a uh, provision allowing for up to eighty percent indemnity for livestock producers who euthanized animals during the pandemic. Uh, that certainly is going to come into play in uh, states like Minnesota and Iowa, where we had a lot of situations. Uh, with, uh, with hogs, uh, especially uh, during the peak of those uh, packing shutdowns. Uh, USDA also has money that is set aside that communities might be more interested in as well. Uh, the December 8 package set aside roughly $1.5 billion for a wide range of things. Uh, it can go for USDA buying agricultural products, but it can also go for grants and loans for smaller uh, mid-sized uh, food processors to basically build resiliency, deal with the supply chain challenges that they had uh, in terms of coronavirus uh, and, uh, and, and work on improving uh, some, of their, uh, some of their safety aspects or some of their uh, supply chain aspects. So that was $1.5 billion that was set aside that pretty much gives USDA, you know, pretty broad authority to do something with. Uh, USDA announced uh, that they're going to have a, uh, a special listening session on March 19th uh, on what to do with this money. You know, they have open comment uh, on um, uh, Federal Register to comment on this money before March 31st. Uh, certainly, I think a lot of this will go probably back to those uh, food boxes, but there's still opportunities for other things to, to happen. And in the bill that is now in Congress that they're debating right now, they took that same provision that they had in the December bill and they bumped it up to add $4 billion more to it. So potentially USDA will have $5.5 billion of this money to use for different things. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what's gonna be available for grants especially uh, that can be applied uh, whether communities need to be involved in the, engaging in those grants, that sort of things. Uh, there's a lot in this other bill that deals with emergency aid for rural health care and allows USDA to basically set up vaccine programs and uh, even temporary uh, health care structures and provide medical supplies uh, in low income areas and uh, increase telehealth capabilities as well. So. Uh, uh, and certainly, Lord knows, there's a lot of money that is going towards rural broadband, both in the bill that passed in December and the bill that is uh, before Congress right now that uh, is out there. So 
uh, opportunities, I think, for smaller communities across the country to really beef up their rural broadband access uh, in different ways. Uh, so there's also includes some special funding for underserved communities for emergency housing aid in this in this funding bill as well, and also even some rural transit grants uh, that uh, might uh, come available. Uh, another provision in this bill that uh, I've uh, written a couple of articles about is special language for socially disadvantaged farmers to essentially wipe out all of their loan debt um, from through FSA direct and uh, loan guarantee programs. Um, the way this is defined, it basically involves minority farmers, USDA actually has you know special classification for socially disadvantaged and you can go on the USDA's website and look at the outstanding loans that are out there um, uh, for socially disadvantaged farmers but, but the, the main issue with this provision was that uh, even from some litigation that happened uh, uh, more than a decade ago uh, black farmers had a lot of historic debt with USDA that was not paid off and they're still facing consequences from that. And uh, so you're talking roughly, uh, Maya's understanding is about $2.5 billion that would wipe out some of this long outstanding debt for uh, black farmers. But the provision basically indicates that uh, current loans for socially disadvantaged farmers uh, would be taken care of. Uh, and that has drawn some criticism from um, uh, Republicans who tried certainly in the House and Senate to remove it from the bill. Now that both chambers have passed it, and that is finally, you know, we expect the House to have a final vote on this bill sometime in the, in the coming days. Uh, I don't think there will be any changes to the language and how that bill moves forward. Um, but I was looking at data on FSA loans and loan guarantees for socially disadvantaged farmers. This is just the fiscal 2019 data that was out there. These are your top 10 states. Oklahoma stands out. Uh, and I was looking at data over about two or three different years in Oklahoma because uh, so many farmers in the state uh, are um, Native American, have Native American uh, heritage. Um, they really are very aggressive in terms of ensuring that uh, a large sign up of their farmers take advantage of uh, what USDA provides for socially disadvantaged farmers. Uh, looking at Minnesota, Minnesota is very low in that, uh, only about $5 million in loans. Iowa's about $11 million in homes. I was impressed that South Dakota really jumped up out there. So these are your top states for these. FSA socially disadvantaged farmer loans that are currently active in Oklahoma and Texas are the two states that uh, really are, uh, take advantage of these loans more than anybody else. So beyond getting beyond the, the emergency situation and COVID aid itself, what USDA uh, coming in with this new administration really wants to focus on is uh, climate change and agriculture. Uh, President Biden has a goal to move the country to net zero emissions by 2050. That is a very challenging goal. Um, you know, as much as we have reduced emissions over time, um, you know, we've reduced emissions about 12 to 13 percent from our 2005 levels. Um, but uh, to get to net zero emissions, uh, is again a very aggressive goal to happen and uh, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack is really tasked with starting the push uh, for that in, uh, in agriculture in different ways. Ag emissions are about 10% overall, give or take, it, it fluctuates maybe a little bit on a given year, but uh, about 10% of overall U.S. emissions. Uh, everybody will say, you know, there'll be certain sectors that will say, well, we're only 2% of U.S. emissions, we're only 3% of U.S. emissions. Well, you know, uh, if you're 2% of United States emissions, you are basically having about the same amount of emissions overall as the entire country of France. Our emissions, we, we have a lot of emissions in the United States. So when you're 1% of U.S. emissions, you're about the same amount of emissions as the entire country of Belgium. So 
you know, 1% in the United States of something is, is actually quite a bit uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of the world. But uh, right now, the House and Senate Agriculture, right now, the Ag Committee at this moment is supposed to be holding a hearing on uh, uh, climate change. I tried to uh, watch the very beginning of it before, before I got on, but for some reason, it was, uh, it was a little bit delayed. Um, so you hear a lot on the terms of regenerative agriculture, soil health, climate smart practices. We're talking a lot in terms of crop production about no-till agriculture. We're talking a lot about cover crops. Uh, when you look at what USDA will be focusing on, they'll be looking at tapping the conservation programs that we already have out there and finding ways to really enhance uh, the opportunities for uh, uh, developing and expanding soil health practices. Um, there's a lot of talk and discussion in the initial stages about using the Commodity Credit Corp funds that USDA has to create a carbon bank. We don't exactly know what that means at the moment, but uh, what I think it will translate into is rewarding farmers who have been doing these practices over a long period of time, uh, recognizing that and providing some benefit for them. Uh, also, maybe providing benefit for a farmer that is doing all the right practices, but maybe just because where they farm in the country, they're not sequestering carbon at the same rate that you might actually sequester carbon in a rich soil area like you see in the upper Midwest. Um, I, I think overall what will end up happening for USDA is USDA will end up basically as a certifier, uh, more or less. Think of the organic program. USDA's main function in the organic program is to certify practices and to certify uh, and validate. I, I think that you will see USDA, that will essentially be a, a big role USDA will play in these carbon markets going forward. The carbon markets are going to be the thing that they, they are really trying to aggress uh, aggressively push. And more or less, you think about it as a, as a market for conservation practices, really uh, what you're talking about. But another aspect I think you will see is USDA will take its rural development programs and expand that out for rural, renewable energy projects as much as possible. Uh, Vilsack did this in some sense uh, under the last time he was the agriculture secretary. He took special funding in rural development and used that specifically to go to expand biofuel uh, uh, areas. Uh, it helped pay for blender pumps and things like that at uh, service stations. So I, I think you will see some of those kind of aspects from uh, the Trump administration, excuse me, the Biden administration going forward. A um, couple things though that are gonna get, I think very complicated very soon uh, as it comes down to is where we're at on biofuel policy. Uh, the EPA administrator supposedly today, maybe tomorrow will finally get a final vote in the Senate and be confirmed. Um, but are a lot of questions about how EPA is going to manage the renewable fuel standard uh, beyond what EPA is sets to do in the Biden administration. Right now, we have a Supreme Court case that will come up uh, later this spring over uh, EPA and its uh, refinery waivers. Um, EPA put out a note uh, last week saying that you know they will not um, support what the Trump administration did. They will not defend that uh, before the Supreme Court. They will instead be siding with the Renewable Fuel Association and uh, those groups uh, in making the case that uh, uh, EPA itself has been way too uh, gracious with these small refinery exemptions uh, to petroleum producers over the past few years. Uh, I think, uh, as you've seen, Minnesota is a prime example of states that are becoming more aggressive on their own as uh, Minnesota pushes to have a 15% biofuel standard. I would love to see Iowa and Nebraska and a few other states follow Minnesota's lead in this regard. Um, you know, the uh, Nebraska governor yesterday was just talking about, you know, they did a study on E30 on their fleet vehicles and found that they don't really have any kind of emission or any kind of challenges with their fleets on 30% uh, ethanol. 
Uh, with that, I'm going to throw a plug to CHS and Cynix. Uh, I'm, you know, we have an E40 uh, blender pump where I live. I drive a flex fuel pickup, and I find that driving on a 40% blend that I'm really not losing any mileage compared to E10 or any kind of uh, performance issues. So, uh, so hopefully we'll see we'll be going beyond E15 in certain states and see maybe E20, E30, E40. That would be uh, more exciting to see. Moving ahead though with the RFS, uh, another challenge that is kind of coming up is what happens to after 2022? Because EPA will move forward beyond the legislation itself and EPA will set its own kind of standards. But um, it takes a long time for EPA to write these rules on what they're going to do. So sometime we think by the end of 2021, EPA is going to have to at least put out the proposal of what it expects to do with the renewable fuel standard going forward. And, and how aggressive will EPA use the renewable fuel standard to continue to lower emissions and, uh, and liquid fuels uh, is something that we'll have to see. I, I think that you'll see the Biden administration get pretty aggressive in using EPA to lower emissions. Ideally, they will be tapping the renewable fuel standard to make some of that happen. So we'll see. Some uh, other issues on the horizon that need to be thought about though, uh, when it comes to agriculture is we're gonna see more regulatory challenges uh, with EPA, uh, particularly when it comes to issues such as pesticide management. Uh, the Trump administration was uh, was very lenient uh, when it came to regulations of pesticides compared to even what their own scientists have recommended. Um, I think you will see EPA expect to be more demanding when it comes to uh, some of the pesticide regulations out there uh, going forward. Um, it's gonna be curious to see, we still have the issue out there on how exactly we treat gene editing when it comes to regulatory practices and how will they treat that. Then there's the issue that you know really scares uh, uh, farmers at times when they talk about uh, you know the waters of the U.S. rule that uh, was uh, was written under the Obama administration, the Trump administration had a much more lenient rule called the Navigable Waters Rule. Uh, both of these ended up in litigation for the exact opposite reasons. Um, this is uh, always the problem when Congress is just going to lift its hands up and say, we're not going to deal with it. We're going to let the agency deal with it. And whatever they do, we're going to criticize it. But one way or another, EPA will be right in the middle of trying to deal with how they address, uh, you know, water regulations going forward. And whatever they do, nobody will end up being happy at the end, is what I believe, because it's just a longstanding challenge out there. Um, but going back on that, you know, one of the great aspects of some of the climate smart practices I should mention Look, if you're sequestering carbon in the soil at a greater rate and you've got a lot of buy-in in that, you know, you are also ending up using the same exact practices that sequester carbon in the soil also translate into cleaner water. If we get big buy-in within agriculture and using climate smart practices and carbon programs, sequestration, that long-term also translates into water and cleaning up the water. And, uh, and, and that would be a... Uh, a tremendous boom in terms of dealing with, you know, ag's really biggest environmental challenge, which is water quality. So just want to throw that plug in there. Um, trade priorities, you know, hey, things are really going well right now in terms of agricultural sales. We had record sales last year. We think we'll have record sales again this year. The China sales have been tremendously strong. Uh, that's why our Crop insurance guarantees are where they're at right now. Um, the question going forward with China and the U.S. I think maybe certainly goes beyond agriculture. You know, a lot of companies in the United States are going to want to see the Biden administration lift the tariffs that we have on Chinese imports. We're still kept tariffs on roughly three hundred billion dollars of everything that we buy from China. Uh, are we going to see that uh, these tariff situations are going to be lifted? Um, there's a lot that still needs to be addressed in terms of implementation of the USMCA. Uh, Canada is expected to do some things with uh, dairy that uh, have not happened yet. 
we're getting some problems with uh, biotech approvals in Mexico that need to be addressed. Problem right now is uh, Catherine Tai, the uh, USTR nominee. She has not been confirmed yet by Congress. They hope to have her confirmed before they maybe take their Easter break, which means maybe sometime before the end of March, she will be confirmed. But, um, you know, it takes a long time to get trade negotiations that are really credible and, uh, and serious to begin to happen. The legislation that makes that easier for uh, the USTR to negotiate these things called, is called Trade Promotion Authority. Congress basically gets a laundry list of things that they want to see addressed in a trade negotiation and says, if you do these things, we'll sign off on your trade, uh, uh, trade package without trying to change it. Um, that expires at the end of June. And as anybody knows, dealing with the United States Congress, you don't want to offer them a trade bill that they can make a bunch of changes to. So they want, you want to give them a bill, a trade uh, treaty that they can basically pass kind of like they did with UNCA. So we'll see what happens going forward and how aggressive the Biden administration is with trade. But I don't think they're going to be very aggressive, certainly early on. They want to focus on securely dealing with uh, the coronavirus and, and getting back to some normalcy, so to speak. So uh, trade itself is not uh, the biggest priority in terms of uh, getting new deals going forward. And, you know, there are a lot of things that I have not fully addressed. Uh, I, as I was thinking about this, a slide that I should have probably Im implemented and added in uh, really deals with um, what are we going to do with uh, livestock markets going forward? There's a bill called the Livestock Mandatory Price Reporting Law that is supposed to be reauthorized. Uh, last year, the House and Senate Agriculture Committees did not really touch it. Uh, they kicked it down to the end of this year. So if that's the case, hopefully we will hear some, get some hearings from uh, Congress uh, relatively soon so that we can address some of these livestock issues out there. There are a lot of bills in Congress that want to uh, mandate that packers buy a certain percentage of their cattle from quote the cash market, for instance, uh, and, and, and address some of these things out there. But uh, uh, we need to have some hearings on uh, what direction we're going to see from Congress, consolidation within both the livestock and the, uh, and the, the um, crop industries are big issues going forward. And then the question is, when Congress might address the next farm bill? Uh, we're looking at ideally 2023 is when we would have a next farm bill. Well, right now we have a Democratic Congress both the House and the Senate, even though it's an incredibly tight margin in both. Um, we all understand that in midterms, the party that runs the presidency often loses their chambers in the midterms. So if the Democratic Congress wants to see a farm bill passed, will they get a farm bill done before the end of 2022 that would be implemented in 2023? Or will they allow that, uh, you know, the risk that uh, they do lose the House or they do lose the Senate, and then we have to have a Republicans uh, taking over one of those committees to write the farm bill, uh, which would, would basically be a, uh, it, it would really complicate certainly the issues that the, the Democrats want to address in terms of climate change. We, we know people, we've seen this theme before between Republicans and Democrats, uh, when the how, when one of the chambers flips uh, in the middle of writing a farm bill, you see a lot of changing priorities that happen really quickly. So, so big question is whether we'll see Congress get a farm bill done before the end of 2022, or that will that carry over into 2023 with some of these issues that uh, I just mentioned still on the table to be addressed. And uh, I hope I good on time. Uh, and I hope I still have some time for the questions from questions from you guys. Yes, so now would be a great time for any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much, Chris, for the wonderful information. I hope it was useful so far. Indeed. Uh, we have a thanks, Chris, great information in the chat. Well, thank you. And we 
have, what do you think is the number one policy issue for farmers? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, in some sense, it depends a little what you're farming, but really trade um, is, um, is a big, tremendous topic. Um, I probably didn't appreciate it nearly as much until uh, Trump came into office. Uh, I didn't cover trade as aggressively as I found myself over the past four years covering. Um, it takes time to get trade uh, bills and, and trade negotiations passed. If you think of all the things that happened with the Trump administration, um, 2018, 2019, things were really a struggle in terms of prices for producers because we were all these trade fights. Finally, at the very beginning of 2020, um, we did a deal with Japan that opens up markets for trade. We did a deal with China that uh, supposedly long-term is supposed to be tremendously aggressive on trade. We get USMCA locked and sealed and passed. All these things took three years to finally come into play. And then unfortunately the pandemic hits as all these trade deals have finally come in to come to pass. And for the first six months of 2020, we didn't really see all of this stuff really come into uh, play the way it was supposed to. The last five or six months of the year though, as uh, as the ship started moving and everything started happening, we saw that trade really did take off tremendously uh, uh, from and benefit ag benefiting from all of these deals. It, but it took two, three, four years to make it happen. And if Trump, if Biden's team wants to do something big in ag, like a, a trade deal with Europe, uh, it again will take two, three, four years to finally get something locked in place. Uh, and so it's one of these, um, you know, long-term rewards uh, situations, so to speak. Uh, it takes time to negotiate. Uh, feelings get hurt along the way. And then finally, you get something that everybody can live with, and, and you start to see that sales expand. Um, uh, and, and certainly that was what we saw under the Trump administration. Thank you. We have another question. Um, what support are you hearing from the ag organizations on some of the issues that you brought up? Well, in the climate space, um, a lot of the ag groups have formed a coalition to, uh, to basically have their voices heard on, on what they want. Um, their big aspect and big focus on that is to ensure that things are voluntary when it comes to uh, what USDA or EPA does when it comes to agriculture. Can agriculture remain a voluntary sector in terms of reducing emissions while we're putting mandates on the energy sectors or on industry sectors uh, will be a big question going forward because certainly uh, there are a lot of groups that say Ag will not really see its emission reductions uh, hit what they need to be uh, until things start to become mandated. And once you start mandating something on agriculture going forward, though, uh, it becomes a, uh, a kicking and screaming dogfight going forward. Um, so the ag groups have gotten together. They've tried to lay out a blueprint. Um, but this will be the thing that I think at least all of this year, we're gonna see so much focus on what USDA, what the Biden administration are going to do to really get big buy-in from, uh, from farmers uh, on their agriculture, on their climate agenda. So it's a long answer, I apologize, but. Good answer, thank you. All right, any other questions that anybody has? chat here again. Um, what would be the best way to stay uh, like in the know or um, in touch with or connected with the D, the DTN or the progressive farmer? Well, um, you can go to, uh, you know, DTN.com and, um, and, uh, and look at all of the suite of um, uh, things that DTN has to offer that uh, that might fit you. I, I am uh, tragically, I am not in sales, and uh, I could not sell you know 
heaters in, in Canada. So uh, that's how bad of a salesperson I am. But, uh, the, you know, if you want to, uh, there's a lot that DTN has to offer in terms of uh, market information and things of that. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, just basically, you know, some of the things that we're, we're involved in in terms of our news articles, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and uh, I do my best to try to re retweet the, uh, the top stories that we have on a given day, uh, that sort of thing. Um, or if I've got something I need to rant about, I can do that too on social media. But, uh, you know, if you were to follow uh, myself on Twitter, uh, I, I try as much as possible to provide some of the things that we're focusing on on a daily basis. All right, big round of applause for Chris Clayton. Thank you so much for presenting today. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, on your screen, you can choose leave room to go back to the main waiting area for the next presentation. Thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of the day, all right? Thank you so much, Chris.